Hello everyone, today we talk about the characteristics of seigneurial communities. Uh, in, in a broader political and social sense, we'll see naturally also partly at least the development of the military class as we define it with some bit more of uh, consistency and formalized consistency at least um, in this moment that we can ideally trace like in the bound within the boundaries of the 10th century but actually that goes far beyond not just because you know it was uh, naturally there was a gradual definition eventually of the uh, knightly and feudal elite over time a consolidation of this essentially extremely um, let's say stratified society at least you know hierarchical uh, society but also because the world, as we explained many times, and we can't squeeze this dynamic within just you know post Carolingian realities, was the one of a seigneurial one, right? Uh, the ancient world was a, in this sense a much more aristocratic reality in a sense than than uh, than the, the Middle Ages from a strictly ideological point of view, because um, this, it was simply a less uh, secularized society, and we've mostly been told the other way around, right? Instead, this is just an illusion because we're not enough documented about the ancient world, but the trend we see is quite significantly in favor of a, a gradual, you know, properly not immersion, but let's say construction of what we think as a more regulatory system where more or less the individual has properly more rights by itself. Christianity definitely helped as it taught the world that, you know, even slaves are human beings, something that nobody objectively really, really had thought before. And as we often explain, and maybe seigneurial society is a bit, you know, much more pictorially so, the world had exclusively been ruled by mobsters, in a sense. Like before the creation of what we call a state, like the normal reality was a clanic society that was one of the most, you know, of course, unstable, violent, um, and dysfunctional in, in terms of effectiveness, etc. Realities that uh, simply had that level of development and remained often f some parts of Europe for a very long time. So because they didn't have enough resources to to accumulate, to to construct, to expand into something more civilized, fundamental. Um, we have explained abundantly this process of um, seigneurial development in the past, especially in the first years of Schwerpunkt, and uh, we come back on it in here pretty randomly, as uh, as always, um, and we'll surely keep talking about this. Uh, we also talked a lot about the context here, properly the post carolingian uh, era, uh, so in this moment of collapse, essentially, of public authority, that facilitated the uh, just the, 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 the construction, the affirmation, probably also from a legal, formal point of view of the scenery. This scenery already existed w from w within, right? It's a mistake to believe that before the fall of the Carolingian War, this, this ideal of the of lordship didn't wouldn't exist right this was a an old legacy as we were saying before uh, in terms properly of the idea that the, the stronger rules over the weaker that that's since the the tribal primitive world uh, the germans fundamentally believed the same thing in terms of the wealth and the, the the enormous concentration of power in the hands of a few people because of the richer uh, realities that as we will see here we're talking about gold mostly um, and a, sp a specific distribution of wealth in the latifundium system because even in this regard the lack of equally powerful mm, elites in Germany and in Italy compared to France is also due to different forms of wealth distribution but not n and not at all because of you know um, any um, let's say an even cultural idea of what what is freedom for for example because fundamentally even the eastern frankish kingdom would evolve without too much there would be resistance to that but as you know germany would fundamentally transform into a a lordship in itself that these people traditionally were not free whereas in the italic kingdom there was a tradition of freedom and of 
concentration of wealth and higher in, properly in the middle classes that uh, so the development of a completely different system but it's france pro what would, would would become france right and also the surrounding areas broadly meant um uh, france i mean here always francia francia meaning uh neustria roughly and areas so today's Benelux, but all around, even in parts of Western Germany, in Southern France, Burgundy, Alemania, think about these. Uh, and um, I don't know where I was going with this, but yeah, I mean, the, the idea is that the Gallo-Roman society, specifically, that this was the dominate, the dominate was the lordship was a, a Roman legacy, right, that in France, in Gaul, had remained intact right the idea of why the, the reason why the franks were so powerful is that they fundamentally had blended into the gallo-roman elite and managed these enormous um, extensionally speaking but extremely fertile atlantic plains that differently from other areas of the roman empire had not um, suffered uh, let's say a destructuration like a break a trauma like in other areas of the empire, and therefore the wealth had remained concentrated in the hands of these elites since Roman times. And you know that even in pre-Roman times, the Gauls were fundamentally heading towards probably a feudal society, where even in there there were a few people with lots of money, and the others were basically just serfs. Uh, and um, these things do wait, but let's say it, it, they are the normal, because we come mostly from a modernistic historiography that tells us that, I don't know, the Romans, the, the Greek historical were kind of democratic realities. They weren't, right? And that was the normality, absolute, the, uh, the absolute normality at the time, right? Their enormous power was, you know, tied properly to the capacity of controlling enormous amount of lands of people through a few. Uh, leaders, very few elite, right? And this was on a smaller scale true also in the tribal world, that very far from being an egalitarian one in the sense of, you know, properly the commoners was just uh, essentially, as we were saying before, mobsters uh, mm, complaining every time somebody became more powerful than the other and for the rest exploiting savagely uh, with the most you know, the worst kind of atrocities that have nothing to envy to the almost concentration camp like the Latifundian reality in Rome, um, uh, with slaves working there, uh, in fact, the Roman Empire itself. So, uh, the, the, the subjected people. So, um, it's, it, these are the hardcore basics of, of the story because if one starts from some mm, delusional ideas of democracy of egalitarianism either in the, in the germanic or in the roman world it's properly that they they don't know what history is like literally but heavily so like since the at fundamentals level and uh, also um it, it's properly to be understood also the, man the maintenance however of a system in spite of the collapse of public authority after the collapse of the Carolingian Empire, that never had quite of a public culture, right? Uh, the Carolingians had built the empire in a feudal sense, that is, all their military might, etc., was essentially uh, a bit like the Roman Empire, was about uh, having this dramatic military uh, power, this deterrent power to invade our lands, consolidating them, uh, grabbing their resources and reinvest them and when the expansion ended there were problems because naturally uh, especially north of the Alps there was properly nothing like a state there had never been historically in in standing at least you know since the end of the Roman Empire but properly uh, as we've seen I mean, in, even in there uh, privatization had taken over towards the end so um, private culture it was at the base of public culture and in fact we made a lot of videos about this one specifically was named like this that is the private nature of Carolingian public power uh, another one was, there were others but, but more with a socio-economical cut like you know from the uh, late Roman villa to the early medieval courtes that kind of has a you know here says but the same things we're talking about from that point of view um, but Properly here, we have to stress the, the fact that the Franks didn't know, like properly by education, by vocation, and especially by this lordly uh, military privatistic mindset, what public culture or a state were. They properly, they, they didn't know. The Franks did one thing better than anyone else, that was making war. 
And the reason was exactly because they, they had these elites for which all the rest of the population fundamentally broke their backs in the fields for, so that for them to be professionals. And this was fundamentally unknown in Europe, aside from you know, the subtle-like realities like the Byzantine Empire or the Caliphate of Cordoba. But properly, for in terms of state, of an idea of, say, putting things in common, you see it from the dynasty itself. At every generation, they still split properly the entire empire as if it was the in private inheritance, like they, they would do like in primitive Germanic society. They, they wouldn't change. It would take a long time. In, th in fact, we made a video. Um, all, the world Middle Ages, arguably, if not even beyond. Think about, you know, how powerful our French aristocracy always remained historic. But um, and we made another video that is that was the making of the feudal monarchies or something uh, like that that properly explains how even those say states uh, that we call national monarchies etc started forming from the 12th century at that point had retained this idea of public culture in terms of the existence of a king and an emperor and therefore of an idea of of public rights that were what that, that were kept alive by all these people naturally wanted to 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 put their hands on it and today we explain how that factually happened because there was a massive usurpation of public goods this had always uh, already happened with the collapse of the Merovingian empire that fundamentally was nothing but four different kingdoms and factually by the end of 17th uh, of 7th century not existing anymore the carolingians basically put all the things to get together and great part of the way they founded their own military clientele was exactly confiscating all the lands that historically the local lords had usurped that were once being having been even entrusted by the Merovingian kings on behalf of the monarchy but basically not lasting because there, it, uh, it was coercively speaking impossible to, to maintain and that's all the decentralization we talk about in, in feudalism that still at some point was however uh, under other points of view a, a greater gluing factor from a political point of view than is often conceived um, and the proof being as we, in fact you know as we were saying before for example the, the development of the kingdom of france as as we know it that emerges from exactly the area where decentralization had created the greatest difficulties from properly a governmental point of view and that instead you know, generated basically the greatest power in medieval Europe, and uh, that's that's also a passage that at some point we'll have to to explain. It obviously that, uh, that this passed through the power of the single elites and how they essentially strengthened each other through competition, and some prevaricated, the other managed to to be supreme. So that at the end of the Middle Ages, French institutional juridical culture was fine about. The idea that the king, albeit always existing by medieval standards exclusively in order to defend the pre-existing rights of the communities, was allowed to essentially legislate where you know gaps occurred with the, the, the law that wouldn't work very differently from the Kingdom of England, where basically an inverse culture had emerged, that everything the king did had to pass the you know, had to be agreed, negotiated, at least, with, with the parliament. But you understand the implications of this. So we uh, generally focus, historiographically speaking, on this phase um, of the 10th century, mostly, and in order to define this uh, phenomenon that, as you understand, however, began much before. Think of, there is another video we made about the Frankish Commendatio, for example. There was exactly this... Um, Clientary practice that is a bit from the one from the, which the benef uh, Vassalatic beneficiary system emerged it was a Romano Germanic institution fundamentally, and etc. etc. So, aside from the, the natural differences that existed in the making of the signory, and we will, we, here I will say signory uh, because I'm mostly influenced by the, you know, the most developed historiography on the topic that, as you understand, is French, but also in other continental European countries, we say it in this way. Um, otherwise, you can't say Lord, right? Uh, in, in England, it's mostly because of the manor, the manorial system, but in, in, yeah, there are differences in this instance, and we will actually talk about them towards the end. But in the substance, the idea that there is a local, powerful clan leader that owns privately and manages his own business, law, etc., its own way with his band of tags, 
um, and you know collecting resources, whatever, and all the others working for him. That that's essentially the the horizon that we have to set standardly as. This this is this was true also uh, as you understand across, I'd say I mean be, uh, beyond Carolingian Europe. I mean look at Scandinavia. They were basically the same thing, and were just poorer, and, and therefore the elite was less powerful. But substantially, there was no other moral orientation uh, possible, right? Actually, as we will see, maybe not so much today, but we made videos about this, about this. Uh, we were hinting at but the survival still of a public idea, the idea that there is, a, for example, a kingdom with a king. Also territorially, also in terms of laws, the, the idea that the Carolingians had issues, capillaries, that, that uh, these monarchs could uh, differate, they, they were, were pre-existing customs, had to be respected. So that was still, as we've seen, you know, uh, the continent was, was, was a civilization on its own, and it was expanding. And it is fundamental to understand that what we know as modern Europe fundamentally emerged from this reality as well. Because here the post Carolingian kingdoms, roughly, so today's France, Germany, and Italy, are the core of what properly we see as Western Europe in terms of properly what during the Middle Ages emanated from, from all, in all the other places like England, Spain, Sicily, uh, the Slavic countries, etc., in, in this Scandinavia, in this uh, dominating model at the end of the day, that especially from the 12th century boomed, where we can can't call the Frank, you usually call the Frankish model, right, by, by approximation. But it is objectively here, it, it's in Austria, it's in northern France that this thing starts chiefly, because that was truly the, the real center of, of Carolingian power at the end of the day. Now, there is historiographically a substantial agreement, in fact, on, on the main characteristics of the local dominion, and uh, and also on the consequences that the the, solu the, the, the the solving of public power and the affirmation of the seigneurial world had on the community uh, altogether. There are many interesting studies from an economical, social point of view, but also their ideological and cultural uh, representations. We made a video back in the day, it was about Gerbert Rouillac, that was essentially the 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 Christian response to the this privatization even of of the of of the saints cult that is to say these knights that were definitely all but you know um, pious figures in a you know in terms of uh, lived life <laughs> concretely but were sanctified in a sense and not differently from what the previous world had done that is were heroes were those swords in hands were fundamentally if not uh, half gods, but you know, still divinely inspired and having this power. And this is what also flowed into, naturally, in the, uh, in the uh, you know your Western chivalry that we call that existed as a code of mm, as a moral code of rules of you know of of superiority of nobility of elevation etc. Since you know the uh, prehistory of you know the Indo your you know proto Indo European people. I mean that. Tomorrow we'll talk about that even more, but that was, again, like in all warlike cultures, and you find them all over the world before the state was born, in the sense that, you know, that basically the, the universal language everybody spoke, since, you know, everybody believed exactly in the same exact things at the time. Um, much more than we think, and this is, okay, well, let's not digress on this, but you understand that, if, especially if you follow Schwerpunkt from some year you know what you're to uh, we're talking about so for what concerns directly the seniory first of all we have to notice how uh, almost mm, everywhere s the studies tend to use for their analysis uh, an homogeneous typology that is to say for example we try to especially distinguish the many uh, seigneurial prerogatives in the base on uh, on the base of their nature in their, say, uh, area of application, for example, um, there, are, there are terms such as domestic seigneury, speaking of the domus of the lord specifically, or uh, landed seigneury, right? Uh, the, speaking of the estates properly, the idea they had. Territorial, so from a patrimonial point of view, territorial seigneury, 
that instead stresses more the properly the almost geographical dimension of the extension also of these scenarios that sometimes were, were impressive even in their um, very difficult I mean, the possibility of representing them properly from a geographical point of view because they were a superimposition of different rights and or in fact of ban banal lordships were made videos about this that stress more the juridical side of the story that is properly in fact who owned uh, would it own which rights specifically it also, could also intertwine with different scenarios having uh, rights on a same community and sharing them and or conf conflicting on them and all of these stuff. So with, uh, in fact, the first term, so domestic senior, we define mostly those enormous de facto powers that maybe were not even originated by a, a vassalatic delegation. That they, 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 there were sometimes even r very rich merchants that started, they became lords. Even in another situation, think about Samo. Um, think about all the, the, the wealth that was mm, circulating in spite of what we believe happened during the second invasions and or during in fact in the seigneurial economy um, because seigneurial economy entailed that these lords controlled ever larger amounts of goods and therefore kind of rationalized their orientation their, dis their distribution because this system by the way redistributed constantly in order to survive there was no such thing like what some classist interpretation would like to believe that the fat lord where all the, the peasants starve and he treasuring judd no if, if he even wanted to dream to imagine to survive he had to reinvest constantly on, on, on the on the land with castles with bridges with um with the fences for for everybody because you know the peasants were literally why the lords existed <laughs> meaning that without their work without their labor um there was no elite there were no horses, there were no weapons, there were no no time to spend fighting, and therefore they were the most precious assets uh, of, of the lords, and therefore they couldn't be squeezed to, to death, even though surely they lived a pretty atrocious existence. But we're talking about the 10th century, and I don't think there is any of, any of us that wouldn't be to, to, to live an atrocious existence in those conditions. But for them, in a sense, was even normal. Also, here we skip properly the, the causes of it, we, we also discussed, we covered these topics in well, in, in good detail at some level. That is, seigneuries were born largely um, in a consensual way. That is, yes, most of the times there were factually extortions, blackmails, uh, oppressions slash repressions. Sometimes entire peoples were conquered. Think about, I don't know, the Carolingian conquest of Saxon. Made a video on all that. Okay, I stopped that because... <laughs> but just... For, for you to know of my new 2,000 subscribers from, from this year that, you know, it's plenty of older videos that I'm looking at recently just also because I'm setting all different options for the monetization and everything that. It's plenty, plenty, plenty of videos here. Uh, look at the playlist, check them out. I created many new ones. You can find everything in this, uh, in this regard if you're interested. Uh, consensual. Because those peasants might have even taken up arms and peasantry wasn't so passive as we think at this point it was enormously more passive by the end of the middle ages and even more during the modern age right never think that things improved for the average peasant in in, in relation to their lords by the end of the middle ages it's completely the other way around but peasants were just peasants and war was becoming an ever more professional business, as you understand, they wouldn't properly even try to, they would fight alongside their masters, sometimes peasants, peasants are notoriously, in these contexts, like the lowest classes, the, the, the most atrociously violent and, and evil, properly. Um, if you read what, what happened concretely, parts of society, I mean, something unspeakable in terms of, of sheer amount of violence and properly... Mm, to, uh, let's let's a little here, but it's important to stress this that they weren't passive as we understand. They they were even a very clever to seize the opportunities at this scale of you know of of events. But they had agreed to be under a lord because it was simply economically more convenient. In terms of cost benefit ratio, it was better to work on the land your, all your life than trying to defend yourself. Right? Well, it was better to give a, a part of of, of your of your work to the Lord, and he would have provided with his retinues, with his masnata, and then the thing would have 
you know, hopefully gone. You know, if if uh, some raiders arrive, you could um, uh, take refuge in his uh, in his uh, castrum. The, they had they had stocks, right? Um, the 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 castles, importantly enough, were not just for defense, but probably for storing goods. So in terms of thinking times of famines, of devastations, etc., right? And this was a very very militarized context at the end of the day. Um, such that it's a very sensible option, right? Naturally, things got worse, uh, as you understand, but it, it, it was less obvious uh, at, the, at the beginning than it would happen later. Anyhow, um, it's sometimes even difficult to render how chaotic, uh, at some level, the, the collapse of the Carolingian Empire was and uh, how even surely conflictual like the, the peasants were not didn't surely have a good opinion of these lords that very often were were criticized also uh, if, if you wonder why monarchy also kind of remained there by name and just you know mostly these lords were more po powerful than others etc it was because somebody could complain it, it was there could be somebody to complain to and to ask for help to even the second invasions seemingly strengthened, especially in the Western Frankish kingdom, that was the, less, the least obvious to survive among all the, the others. The monarchy, because it, it, it still, in, in front of this external aggression, was a, a matter of hostilities that brought to a sort of pol political compaction around the, the monarchy, even though its uh, capability was very limited at the time. But that's the, the, the order of idea I'm, I'm referring to. Um... So, the um, as we were saying, the the, the domestic scenery um, uh, has to do with um, more more. So it's a different exception. It has to do with the fact that the great landowner uh, can exercise an enormous power over the familia. His familia in Latin, which means essentially those who inhabit uh, in his in his abode, in his mansion. Right, it's like the host cars you see in the Scandinavian area. It was the same thing, right? These were mostly mill armed retinues, right? Um, and we're talking generally of um, subjects of um, servile of, of servile condition, right? And or that even if, if they had been free, they would de facto become largely dependent on the Lord, right? Here we also don't digress about the fortunes of, of sometimes serfs made thanks to their participation to nobility or retinues a much greater career than freemen, right? But I think it's even more important to stress how, even though traditionally these populations of uh, were, were had been free at some point, as at some point as Roman citizens, at some point as Ger Germanic tribes and tribes meant whatever, but as we were saying before, since migration here, a lot of things had changed. Uh, there was always an aristocracy ruling on the poor and fundamentally exploiting them, and um, and even though these, the latter were namely free, de facto they became servants, right? And that's the, properly the, the thing with the seniory, with the subjection, right? You're somebody's possession at the end of the day. Right, it doesn't matter that it's like today at some level. There are some form of feudalism still in our own world. Like if you are poor, that you can't even eat, uh, you kind of start depending on your, uh, on your employer, right? And think about all these great uh, corporate, you know, the problems, the base. Think about Amazon delivers of what these people, or you know, the, uh, the the Uber drivers, all the things, you know. Uh, I mean, some of them are desperate to say, okay, maybe uh, this is shady, but I will do it, or it's a private, it's still better than anything I can f uh, find. So it's much more relatable than we can think. And, and, and this was, in, 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 in a nutshell, the history of humanity as we know it, in every society, right? Uh, then, in the category of, let's say, uh, landed seigniory, let's call it this way, there are also those prerogatives that derive from the possession of the management of lands, and that uh, they come to wait only on the uh, of the peasants of the lands given in concession, granted in concession. So the the uh, right 
to collect cannons and donations uh, to uh, demand determined corvée, so unpaid la labor performance, even today, pretty easy, right? You start working somewhere, okay, yeah, for a while, you, it's just for free, right? It's the same thing, in a sense. You want a job, you want further protection, you want more, you, you, for a while, you will work for free. Again, very relatable. And more in general, however, to exercise various forms of conditioning, of protection and discipline of the community that lived uh, the, and worked, uh, as you understand, because that was pretty standard on the land, right? This is this was seen, as we were saying before, also in a, ideologically, as you know, mostly at this time we rely on ecclesiastical sources that tended to be much more kind of, uh, you know, ideological in that the theoretical or ideal reality, but um, uh, there was, as we were saying before, also some benefits from this state of, of, of things. Um, so we can define as a landed scenery. I couldn't find a better translation for the original term, but I guess uh, it, uh, we explained before how there are different ways, but at the end of the day we're talking about these lordships that are based on land possession. Um, both the um, prerogatives exer exercised on the peasants um, uh, on their lands by the uh, greater uh, lay uh, and uh, ecclesiastical owners, both uh, and and the um, uh, rights that the same lord of the castle exercises, not on the totality of the inhabitants, but only on those. Uh, that to whom he has granted in concessions the lands of his own property. Um, so, yeah, did we, we could digress on what it means to be one's own property. So we will say it uh, later. As we were saying before, there was a lot of usurpation of public goods. But eventually also uh, this enormous... Uh, user patience couldn't be countered by the state for centuries to come. So that these prerogatives became recognized de facto because the kings could also, you know, uh, rec legitimize that by, by issuing a charter and in exchange for, for money, for, for favors. Uh, it's important to stress here that economy by the tenancy entry, yes, there, there is monetary circulation, but it's overwhelmingly agricultural, of course. And especially so in continental Europe, especially, but uh, in properly, the, 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 so much that the Mansus itself it was the, the land plot, right? It became kind of a standard measure of um, evaluation at the time, even if it could vary in size, whatever, but of course the land was the base, like in pre any pre industrial society. In this. But since, as we've seen, uh, these guys had lots of lands, it, everything, it's as if gravitated even more around them. Right, it was literally the the unit sta the standard unit of measurement. Now, in the case of let's say the encastled lordships, however, such powers were intimately connected with the uh, with prerogatives of more general character, but also of greater weight. Right, and this is uh, probably the rural signatory par excellence. Right, that giving life to uh, autonomous nuclear of power. It represents the uh, most capillar and fundamental le um, level within which the political, administrative, and fiscal relations operate. According to Chris Wickham, for example, he, this was the local version of the state. And it is right, right, because literally there was no other state. Like, above these people, there was technically nobody, de facto at least. You know, formally, yes, the king, the emperor, whatever but we know there weren't even emperors for a while. Um, and these people were the ones who owned real power, right? And encastellation, that is another topic today we don't discuss, we've made videos on, is essentially the entrenchment of these lords 
within their own, their own prerogatives that is try to dislodge me from here and castellation was largely not due to the second invasions it was due largely to this structuring of local landed property you say well yes but they were still attacked yes but we know easily in our archaeological for example that the castles built for uh you know stopping i don't know the vikings the, the saracens the, the magyars normally were built in impervious areas in those times of emergency and then abandoned the largest castles, the ones that were properly the, the center of senior power, were in, 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 the, in the midst of the rich areas, properly where they could control more directly their, their agricultural resources. Right? Not that these wouldn't be under attack, etc., but, they, you know, when raiders, yes, it was, you know, they weren't passing by every day. Uh, sometimes raids happen every once in uh, some, some years, sometimes even for decades, right? Everything was, didn't happen. But these guys kind of fought each other all the time from castle to castle from seniority to seniority and uh, the castles were primarily used for, for that reason now in order for such um, rural uh, rural seniority to, to 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 appear it's necessary that the seniorial prerogatives um, let's say ex exceed the limits of his um estate possession and of his own workers extending thus to all the residents of a determined area independently from uh, the uh, juridical status of the cultivated land that can belong to the same lord to other landowners or to the same peasants sometimes as we were saying before this is bypassed and that's properly what arrives to create the landed seigneury because at that point the lord becomes a title holder de facto of a set of powers of coercion and command that are much greater uh to those of an average uh you know land owner right and that can be uh applicated to so or somebody that owns a land just owns a seigneury just on the guys that work on his own land but it can be applicated to the wall population of a certain district right consequently with the affirmation of this type of signory that more or less reunited um, organically uh, economic and judiciary powers uh, in general the uh, exploitation of peasant work uh, worsened so that was the measure of, of how powerful the lord was Right, and the military element, if you wonder why properly knights, the militia, the, the, the senior lordships, etc., developed in a kind of a formalized way at this point, uh, as a standard pretty much all over the Frankish post Carolingian Europe, but beyond in a greater sense, because the tendency, in, even in, in, in other countries, is to the increasing power of the aristocracy. Sometimes by osmosis, even just with the post-Carolingian one, and uh, we explained this even in the process of evangelization, it was largely an internal thing, right? Nobody factually imposed from, from just the dirt. It's, it's rare to find things like, I don't know, the, the, the Carolingian conquest of Saxony and forced conversion. Like, conversion started from within the same pagan realities because aristocracy so fit to establish... Uh, a very convenient uh, administration uh, that was based on a land, or properly on a sedentary base, on a, on a, on a landed property with, with, with an administration with some prerogatives, etc. As just a church could do, and in parallel developing their own monarchy in turn and sacralizing it and so on. So, and and if you really want to fight something ideological there, it's it's really a waste of time because their opponents, so the ones of the true heroes of tradition and paganism, as soon as they had the chance to become as powerful as these guys would do exactly the same thing, right? And so as soon, as soon as, uh, as balance switch that happened dramatically often, so it, it's also dramatically easy to see. So this has nothing to do with any form of, uh, anybody cared about the... Uh, the idea of it. it was just factual power that did stem an improvement uh, in properly in the organization as we've seen the, the discipline of society of control of command of defense right so states were born like this 
also in other eras. So it, it's not the tragedy that the neo, I don't know what you want to call it, ethno-nationalistic delusion among the, the youngers today is about, you know, no, we have to revert to tribes. That's a denial of of Western civilization, a denial of conservative values, a denial of the dignity of human intelligence, to tell it all. Because if you just have an idea how people lived in, in, in tribal times, you you know, I think any Western person would be disgusted. But maybe you, 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 you watch it being done by uh, an ISIS, uh, ISIS uh, whatever you call it, like terrorist, uh, yeah, ah, those fucking you know foreigners, whatever, they're disgusting, they're inferior. Yeah, your ancestors in tribes did exactly the same thing, but those are cool, right? Because they are, they they kind of look like you, and that's the level of mental underdevelopment of of the masses today. That we we have completely lost the plot of what it means to be uh, properly a decent human being before even you know being intelligent or whatever, but which should come accordingly. But properly and also, of course, not knowing anything about the same history that you're. Uh, quite uh, pitifully, uh, you know, instrumentalizing without even know what what it is. That is open history books. Sometimes, if you want to pretend to give ex- historical explanations, um, so the condition of rural population, in all likelihood, um, uh, but we're not certain about it completely, um, uh, suffered a worsening. Right. However, it seems a certain that for altogether to the European um, for European economy and the birth of this heavier form uh, of dominate had very positive consequences as we were saying before if the ratio would be that you know the freer you are the better you live uh, basically at this point we would have never evolved from cavemen Right. Uh, it turns out that the, the founding of human civilization is not freedom, but liberty, which are two very different things. That you know, liberty recognizes the necessity to negotiate and to always make a, at least a minimal effort to put something together to organize something functional, from a state of point of view. Right. If, if you think that loss in freedom is a measure of life quality. Look at, you know, we live in in the most powerful states that mankind has ever seen, where you literally can't tear the thing down. In the Middle Ages, you could relatively easily pick a pitchfork, also because your life was dramatically cheaper, by the way. So also, motivationally speaking, things were overthrow, like, you know, making a mess, or at least sensibly altering, in proportion, in relative terms, the uh, the situation. Uh, it's not the case. We live in wars in which we accept the positivity of authority. And uh, yes, uh, the uh, juridical condition of the inab- of post-colonial inhabitants may have worsened, and definitely much so in certain cases. But the truth is that Europe began to boom economically, and the roots are exactly in the 10th century. The, the great revival of the year 1000 is actually something that started before, and it started, surprise, surprise, also, at, I would say, especially in, in this phase. So that should surely arise some question. Now, the multiplication of the canons of the judiciary, um, let's say, uh, duties, uh, the impositions, and other demands of the lords obliged the peasants to work more intensely. And also in a more c- coordinated direction. Mm-hmm. If you have lots of people working separately for their own business and you, you don't have much of a vision until somebody puts together enough wealth to kind of condensate the opinion about the you know the positivity of the ad- advantage of addressing that in a common direction, right? History teaches us that these are values that you have to teach people because people intuitively or instinctively do not understand uh, the value of order, of authority, of civilization, of progress, right? That's why, I don't know, even banally, tribes were less disciplined than states, right? Because they properly lacked that. They didn't have a superior discipline. Um, they were much looser in themselves, and that's why they unavoidably got crushed under the heels of civilization. Contemporarily, uh, the growth in probably... Uh, can say the crop properly the production the the land 
uh, the estate rent uh, grew, right? And that is the, the amount of economical resources that, that the lay and ecclesiastical elites could use for their own consumption, that, as we've seen, was fundamentally reinvested further to strengthen the seigniory from a territorial point of view and expand. Right? If you wonder how the great houses of Europe were, they started like this, right? Sometimes very humbly. So, but um, so a an, an important economical consequence on the market is that the demand of say valuable and properly luxury products increase and also as a consequence the uh, trade and uh, artisan production uh, the specialized artisan production did in turn the increase in uh, the uh, number and wealth of artisans and merchants right so not just the lords in, um, in, uh, stimulated new production and new trade. The economical development received thus a formidable impulse. And on the long run, who actually took advantage of this the most were the cities. If you wonder where the great urban civilization of the Middle Ages w was born, well, as we have explained countless times, it was tanks, of course, S to its district, to its countryside. Right, because the cities developed, uh, whether they were old Roman cities still um, functionally so, and or new areas of new foundation, bricks, etc. Different stories we, we told in the dedicated videos. Well, the city was uh, or the towns. To, uh, for not everything is a civitas, right? In this context, but let's say that. The settlements were the areas where the uh, that rep, mm, that replenished the, the nobility as well, right? Were the place where stuff was sold and properly the points of connection, international trade on a larger scale, and so on. This international idea of also why the militia, the knighthood, uh, the spread so as a kind of a broader class consciousness of mm, superiority based on the nobility, on arms, on wealth, etc. Well, it's also thanks, of course, to trade and the fact that, you know, there was a recognition, also a, a transcultural one, not just uh, this, um, the, the, the following centuries would, would be, a, you know, we would see the feudalization of also realities that hadn't been feudal before. Partly for the same reasons, uh, partly for for others of, of, of post colonial Europe, but yeah. Um, so, the uh, cities were the center of the local exchange and also the places of greater activity of the artisans, right? Because these people lived there fundamentally, as they could do without, uh, they could earn enough uh, without working the land. Mm -hmm. There was still a lot of mobility and. Still, as we've seen, the nobility the, the needed the centers as well. So, it was a, an harmonious devil. And aside from the contrast, of course, the conflicts of this did exist. There were interesting trends also from properly an economical crisis at some point of the, of the rural nobility it would bring to the in urbation of the same uh, in some regions of Europe, especially. Um, but the, we can say that the same splendor of, Euro of European urban civilization of the 13th century, this is the apex definitely of it, thus would have been uh, uh, mostly, at least uh, according to certain historians, to the birth of this new voracious form of scenery. It was definitely ruthless, right? In ways it was expanded, etc. But when you study all these little sceneries expanding and so on, the more you the more you study them, you could argue the smaller they were, the, the, the better they knew what they were doing, right? The, there are philosophies of history here involved, and also for the, how did the, the West develop so much, eventually just also by being fragmented, etc. Well, but because, you know, the, the smaller you are, the, the more you you can't see the inherent risks you can make, you're more pressured, right? So you tend to do things better uh, than what a huge, endless empire that unavoidably, if anything, for physical reasons, tend to waste more, right? This is the case of China, this is the case of many other great empires that 
at some point kind of sclerotized because they they lacked internal uh, dynamism. And surely it's not like Piran said. We made a video also about that. That you know, cities were burned all of the sudden because some adventurous merchant decided, without any you know background, to go out there selling stuff. Right? You know, that's kind of a nobody believes in that anymore fundamentally. But we still thank Piran for lots of other interesting intuitions. So some historians define this new uh, form of local hegemony as territorial signaling because they spot, as we were saying before, um, uh, its uh, characterizing element in the capacity to extend on all the inhabitants and the uh, proper, yeah, I mean the resources of, uh, of a certain district. Others prefer the expression banal lordship to uh, stress how the principal characteristic of such signory uh, was the exercise of judiciary, fiscal, and military faculties that had been once a uh, monopoly of royal power. I like this interpretation because, uh, of course, it goes in parallel with that aforementioned civilizational process. Um, the, the 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 mechanisms that brought to the to the collapse of the Carolingian Empire so we, they were still, however, uh, capable of producing this order and to maintain it standing and to reinforce them itself. Right, and part of the reason being that these areas were not the steppe, were not a wasteland, were not places where civilization had never existed in the, in, in the first place. So. On the contrary, all this fragmentation, somewhat as we've seen, spurred also the properly the intelligence of negotiation of a sort of social political contract, right? That boosted also development of law, of uh, of administration, and of the military. So the reference is his banal stands for from the Germanic ban that uh, in uh, Carolingian Europe and not only uh, had uh, indicated the right of the sovereign to emanate orders, to forbid, to punish, and uh, other scholars uh, finally prefer the expression uh, encastled seigneury, castle seigneury, because in the wide majority of cases such type of domination of lordship appears thus uh, connected to the possession of one of more castles. So the banal lordship or castle or territorial lordship, therefore, what you want to call it, was a, um, um, you know, a, a spread phenomenon in almost all the Christian areas of the European continent. Right? It, it achieved, however. Uh, different physiognomies um, depending on the epochs of the regions and on the type of dominus of lord. And it's obvious, for example, that the local dominate exercised by a great noble that, was, uh, uh, that owned more castles could easily assume a different physiognomy to the one, from, from the one of a modest family of local aristocracy, where maybe... Uh, a, gr a great number of relatives um, still split, you know, the jurisdiction over a single castle, which in terms of unit of command, is, in a strategic sense, is not this great thing. But as we were saying before, that had been the same reason why the St. Carolingian Empire had died. So this forcing the idea that still we have to do something that goes, let's say, beyond individual interest, but in a more collective sense, paradoxically, was pioneered more by these... Uh, apparently just uh, individualistic lords than by sometimes greater systems. And, um, uh, yeah, so it, this makes you reflect. So great differences intercurred uh, then naturally between the lay and ecclesiastical signories. And um, the, the ecclesiastical ones were influenced by the characteristics of, uh, of the property of the owner, because they could be a, a rural monastery, a bishop, a community of canons, a church, whatever. Now, uh, equally numerous and impossible to exemplify rapidly are also the geographical differences. 
let's just say this that the greatest difference is probably to be spotted between the banal sceneries of the of central and northern France and the uh, corrective sceneries of um, uh, other uh, of, of other regions such as Italy, Catalonia, and Old Castille, right? Because in these southern regions, actually, there was a higher encastellation density. Um, there was um, like a, a thick uh, fabric of banal lordships that was so incredibly, in fact, concentrated that couldn't develop, let's say, uh, enormous lordships like the ones of France, for the aforementioned reasons. These were areas where wealth w was historically more evenly distributed. These were rich areas, fundamentally. But the commoners had more money purpose, and the elites had had less land, right? This is something that we can see essentially between Spain and Italy. Um, that naturally things varied a lot. Italy probably is the one where there were, you know, uh, surely per capita wealth was the highest. Castille would at least develop in a much more feudal direction. This, this depends. Uh, Catalonia was different because it was more, more Romanized, right? So these were differences you can find even in Visigothic Spain, for example, that initially, since not even in there the Roman Latifundium had gone destroyed, like in Gaul, there was some kind of feudalism to develop in a similar fashion to France. Catalonia was traditionally a rebellious and was more like Italy, right? In, in Italy, the Longobard Kingdom had a, a very even distribution of wealth, which basically the aristocracy competed not just to tear each other apart, like in the Merovingian world, but just to compete for public office in the city. So it was a much more orderly and civil development. And uh, the Longobard King was fundamentally even poorer in land than an average um, uh, Frankish small lord. And this is the reason why the Franks had a professional military, for example, and the Longobards at, at largest didn't, nor any other people, as we were seeing around there. Uh, but this these things are important because they affected eventually. Naturally now, uh, Catalonia and Italy, for example, were 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 Frankicized. They, they were part of the uh, probably of Carolingian legacy, so uh, there were feudal elites there too, right? But they wouldn't be as individually powerful as the French ones, uh, Western Frankish. Let's call it this way. Not only because, as we've seen, also in the center of France, so probably not in the Frankish areas, but what had been roughly the Visigothic, the Bur Burgundian ones, right? And this for the same reason, right? In France, a lot of people. Uh, you know, a, a, a very few people had an enormous amount of power. In in Italy, uh, uh, the average person was richer. And this changed everything. But in terms of castle construction, for example, um, for example, you, you imagine France as being legitimately the country with the, mo the greatest castle, mm, you know, legacy, legacy of encastellation historically. France has the most beautiful castles in Europe, etc. But What's behind that? Behind that is naturally the reflection of what we're saying here, that is, the nobility was richer and built these greater castles. But one of the consequences is that those greater castles made for, for less, uh, uh, less uh, smaller castles, right? Then, of course, most of what we see doesn't date to this time. But still, at the time, we see that the French lordships were much larger Right, and um, and therefore they consequently it, m m more powerful. So they they needed because they had that enough deterrent power, less encastellation within their own territory. In places like Italy, it was different. The same goes for Germany, right? In Germany, also the elites were poorer uh, than France. Uh, the Carolingians made it to social engineering, but some resistance also from from the the Germans, etc., to properly set a uh, vassalatic beneficiary system. So Germany was fundamentally already set in what would remain for centuries, that, that is, even in there, only the lords ruled. And basically every person was not free, but somewhat somebody's serve. Um, but st still, uh, aristocrats were, m let's say, uh, poorer and more. And therefore, um, equally, they had, say, a greater castle distribution with smaller castles and smaller seigneuries. And um, this is fascinating if you think about that. 
Um, so in, 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 the, in, in France, the lesser number of castles determined the creation of dominates of great extension. So this sometimes happened also in uh, places like the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, Germany as well, because, because literally there was less to control. So even in there, it's different from France, who that had a very dense and rich, you know, amount of resources. Whereas you see, I don't know, even in Germany, look at the diocese. So there are a few, but not not because they they are, uh, and they are larger consequently from a territorial point of view. But there is much less within them. So also in there, just the territorial, the extensional parameter is not enough. Um, there are also. On the long run, if you think, for example, at the Norman conquest of England, that brought fundamentally a Frankish model in, in the, in the Anglo-Saxon country. Uh, uh, there is still, since it's a, it's a country built from scratch, where there is no uh, previous form of feudalism, or at least the, pri the private clientels are surely less developed than the ones in you know, France, uh, the Normans... Um, kind of operated a bit more of a control and balance in, in the creation of the kingdom so that um, royal power, royal government would maintain a greater force because it reserved always to its own officers, the sheriffs, public jurisdiction, ter therefore taking it away from the lords and this determined the birth of seigneuries, the manners that could develop rights of justice and command just in a in small part, right, and uh, and while only and only on the uh, on the peasants of the properly of the uh, lordly uh, land, and this allowed the kingdom of England to develop, for example, in a considerably unitary way. The same thing the Normans did in Sicily. There wasn't anything like feudalism before there, so the Normans imported a mixed system for which they uh, they were still feudal, right, like in England, but they kind of counterbalanced the thing more by entrusting more power to, in their, you know, the area at least was much more urbanized, where communities of different, even religion, cultural background, confessions, etc., a different ethnic law, for example. Uh, and therefore, they could play on that. So, and these two Norman count, uh, kingdoms stand, in fact, as the most centralized of, 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 medieval, of Latin Germanic Europe because they um, they had, in a sense, a priori, stripped... Uh, I, I mean, um, bypass the problem of uh, trying to, to, to strip the, the local lords from a power that they had conquered in previous centuries, right? Um, this is the reason why the Duke of Normandy became the King of England in properly also in, with enormous power, because in France it could have not made the same headway, because it would have found dramatically more in, powerful and entrenched lords, right? That there were kind of choking even the same monarchy, but at the same time kind of still, as we were saying before, making this glue that was different to break through. And this is, you know, a favorite, uh, you know, an important theme in historiography. It's also up to the Renaissance. Think about when Machiavelli makes the comparison between France and the Ottoman Empire, right? He says, you know, the Ottoman Empire is more centralized. You knock out Constantinople, it's done. You take over the whole thing. In France, you can't take over, uh, you can't knock out the king, but you still find lots of lords there. You can't... Uh, it's as if they were all smaller kingdoms, and they uh, they will fight to the death because that's their own lands and centuries. They have the rights there to have all their power based there, and uh, they don't depend on a of a superstructure, let's say, at least at some level. So that's how the order of things started historically, and as you understand, it made a terrific difference. Europe-wide, because it, it set some uh, relations of strength that brought these countries to develop all in the ways that we kind of know historically, with all uh, their pros and cons. Now, in, in order to understand correctly the seigneurial reality, it's important to consider that wherever a uh, phenomenon of superimposition and of co uh, competition between the various seigneurial powers mm, happened, um, this brought to get, uh, together, you know, intuitively um, a certain amount of violence, uh, of controversies, of of uh, of quarrels, of and also negotiations, etc. So that's also where the military culture that we know from feudal Europe 
was was forged in a sense and um, and a very common contrast was the one that opposed the banal, uh, the band holder to the uh, let's say estate lords right uh, because strong of the control and defensive structures um, of justice and other prerogatives the banal lord often tried to reduce the power of the other lords by uh, subtracting the, their lands. Their lords, we say lords, but it could be just privates in a in a in a broader sense, as we were saying before, just people with some some land, right? And, and demanding to their own peasants, by the way, cannons and corvées, and more in general, limiting their mm, possibilities, their chances of control on the resources located within the territory. Uh, of the castle and uh, on uh, cultivated that land. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the the notion of command here is very important because this was done properly on behalf of defense. That's the military bias that is often overlooked in this all. That this was done properly for sometimes reasons of major force, not just because these people were obviously the strongest, but also because in this terribly unstable reality with no central power, whatever. Uh, it was literally a struggle for survival all the time, and um, nobody could depose arms in order to. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Never read this period in history, please. Like, you know, this is chaos broadly meant, as if you know these people was the, the triumph of hubris or disorder, whatever. If you look from their perspective, they made an astonishing job to create order, and they made, and that's what normally humans do. But here. The situation is, is quite fascinating. And also the same uh, banal uh, rights, let's call it in this way, very often were, were considered this. They were not uh, referred to a single title holder, but to different lords at the same time. It could happen that uh, some castles belonged in a um, co-dominion uh, to more families, or that uh, certain prerogatives, for example, the judgment of uh, the major crimes, higher justice, or or some types of imposition, could be exercised by other lords, generally more powerful ones that were uh, the owners of n uh, neighboring castles and so on. So, this uh, within this tangle of competitive powers, very often, uh, even the uh, awareness of the different nature of the exercise rights lacked right at, at this point everything was done by force rather than by law and the two things somewhat overlapped though we can't say um, in fact it has to be uh, clear that um, you see in this interpretation uh, distinctions such as banal lordships and the ones from other landowners um, are uh, have been created by historians to analyze this intricate seigneurial juridical reality, but at the time they they would have been completely uh, uh, um, incomprehensible. Like you would have not said, you know, this is a banal lord, this is just a normal other landowner, because the language they spoke was the one of the sword of the land. Uh, of 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 the people too, and uh, meaning that they needed the support, as we've seen, that uh, of the same populations that were, as we've seen, not passive. They also had their own interests. It was a uh, we made videos about this. Uh, a dramatic autonomy sometimes of the peasants to even choose their own scenery to switch allegiance, things like these, because they also had power and uh, the the military the. The preeminence of, of, for example, of mounted uh, professionals, etc., was was already there, but at the same time, not so just so uniformly everywhere, right? So all this happened not as a abuse of power of the richest uh, in to core, right? There was always a counter, you know, element, a countering element, in force in this that also help those same powers to, to become stronger and to, to structure, therefore, in a more uh, robust and orderly fashion, right? 
So yeah, this was a bit of a theoretical video if you want, but I think it does render a bit the, the picture of the wall. For now we stop it here, I just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.